Good morning. And welcome to First United Methodist Church of Duncanville. I am Bridget Maloney, the Minister of Faith Formation. I see some surprised eyes. I am not Abril Goforth, our senior pastor. Abril is not with us this morning. Her husband, Larry Wortman, has been admitted to the hospital. He has a severe case of pneumonia, and she had planned until late last night to be here with us, but he is not well, and she needs to be with him. So let's keep them in our prayers, um, and thank you for putting up with me. And won't you just really appreciate her even more next week when she is back? Um, we have a few announcements this morning. First, um, Betty Dunn is going to come and talk to us about PIP days. Betty. Good morning. Yesterday, about 12 o'clock, all five properties were completed. The last two weeks, volunteers have cut down trees and shrubs and pulled out poison ivy, and yes, they got infected with poison ivy. They tore off rotted wood on homes and replaced it with new wood. They painted. They ham used hammers and saws and ladders and nails and screws and bolts and caulking guns, paint brushes and rollers. They rebuilt fences. They painted the houses. They built new gates. They drug mounds, and I mean mounds, of trash to the sidewalk to be picked up. All the while, laughing and talking with each other, showing concern for each other and for the homeowner, becoming acquainted and visiting with the homeowners, walk, working together to share the smile of God. The five homeowners are happy and grateful. The volunteers are blessed to be a blessing. My heart is always very full when we finish PIP days. To know how the properties looked when we have got there and to see how amazing they look when we finish. To experience the joy and the gratefulness of the homeowners to see the satisfaction of the volunteers who have done things that sometimes they don't really like to do, but they know needs to be done. To remember the support of you, our congregation, and to know that with our in faith, that we can get this done, and with God's help, we do get it done. Thank you so much. And there are two um, both exciting and also for us sad transitions on our staff that are taking place today. Nick Rude, who has been our tech guru, he's waving over there. He has an official title that it's not tech guru, but that's what I call him. Nick is leaving us to travel this summer with the Drum Corps International, which will be a, a huge feather in his cap. Um, he'll learn a lot, and they will be blessed with his service. But today was his last Sunday with us, um, so be sure to thank him for all he has done for us, and um, we will miss him. And also, Danny Solis will be preaching this morning because he is rudely graduating from seminary and wrapping up his internship. You'll have a chance to... And I believe those are all the announcements that I have for this morning. So let us pray together. Loving God, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you. We give you thanks. And we give you praise. And always. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in our responsive call to worship. Praise to the Lamb who is seated on the throne of heaven. Praise be to God who offers God's love to us. Let us sing continually of God's wisdom and power and might. Let our voices be raised in joyful celebration. Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and majesty. 
Let our hearts rejoice at God's redeeming love for us. Amen. Good morning, church. Let us praise our God from our heart. Hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing To my heart to sing Thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain peaks upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I'm come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger In the cross his precious blood Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As you remain standing, join with me in this morning's affirmation of faith. We are not alone. Let's, okay, let's join together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus. The Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us, we are not alone, thanks be to God. I invite the children who are worshiping with us at home to scooch close to that screen you're worshiping through, and all the children who are with us this morning can come forward and join me here at the steps.
Good morning. I wanted to do something a little bit different today because this is your last Sunday with us. Hopefully you'll come back and visit. You're still part of our family of faith. So it's really not visiting, I guess, right? I say I'm visiting, but I'm really not visiting because they're my family. And any of you all, we're going to play a game. Is that okay? You know, usually we, we have a talk. Like, oh, boy, my goodness. One of my leaders, I have, I have some leaders who are going to help us play this game. Let me say that if the grown-ups want to play, you can play. I want to invite my leaders that I've, I've asked a couple people to help lead this game. Um, let's, let's, let's stand up. We're going to play Simon Says. You all know how to play Simon Says, right? Yeah. If Simon tells us to do it, we do it. Why don't we come up here so we have more room? And if Simon doesn't say to do it, we don't do it. And if you all want to stand up and play, go ahead and play. I know the choir wants to play. Y'all always want to play. Get up, choir. You always want to get involved in the sermon. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so, all right, let's just do what Simon says. We <laughs> <laughs> need a doctor. Snap, crack, pop. Let's all sit down. I have a question. Now, thank you to our Simons. Now, and thank you, choir. There was something about that game that just didn't seem right. Did you notice anything unusual about that game? It had toes in it. It had... Simon. There were two Simons. There can only be one Simon. <laughs> Normally when we play Simon Says, the first thing we do is everybody goes, I want to be Simon, I want to be it, I want to be it, I want to be it. You didn't even ask, who are we following? You just followed both of them. How did you decide to follow both of them? Is it because they're grown-ups? No? Did, did they just look like they knew what they were doing? Yeah? You know, in light, life is like, okay, I kind of, yes, I did want to play a game, but there's also, I know you're shocked, there's a lesson to this. I know, right? Whoa! <laughs> There's a lesson to this. Life is like that all throughout your life. There are going to be people who are willing to lead you. There will be wise leaders and good leaders and kind leaders like the ones we had this morning. And there will be not so good leaders and leaders who want you to follow them to help them do not so good things and leaders who are really bullies, leaders who want you to make bad decisions to hurt other people. And in a little bit, we're going to hear a sermon where Pastor Danny is going to talk to us about the one good, good leader, the best leader who we should all, always follow. Who is that good leader we should always follow? God, right. The one leader we can always count on is God. God sends us good leaders, and God calls us to be good leaders. And the way we can do that and recognize those leaders and be a good leader ourselves is to study God's Word and make all of our choices dependent on God's teachings. We were lucky this morning because both of our leaders are godly leaders. It's very important as we go through life to make sure that the people we follow are godly leaders. And that's important, not just for you all as you're young and learning, 
but for all of us grown-ups as we follow and make decisions about the choices we make every day. Let's pray. Dear God, help us remember to be careful in choosing how we lead and who we follow. Amen. Isn't our choir just the best on so many levels? <laughs> we have come to that time in the service when we have an opportunity to be a part of the work of God through our financial gifts, which are then turned into ministries here and abroad. You are able to give to the work of God in this place through the Giblify app, the church website, the mail, and as the ushers will come and pass the plate during the offertory song. Let us pray together. God of wonder, you take our gifts and multiply them in ways that we can only imagine. Help us to look to you for leadership, to look to you for guidance as we lead others. May all that we give be used in your glory. Amen. Yeah. 
Well, let's see if I can get the pastoral prayer off to a better start than I did the uh, call to worship. If we maintain a list of all the people in the church that are sick, in the hospital, on hospice, or for whatever reason just need our prayers, that's an important part of a church, to be in prayer for one another. We have a list, and we're going to scroll through it as I pray in a moment. But if you need to add somebody to this list, someone you know, someone you're related to, a friend, it doesn't matter who, um, feel free to do that, either by calling the church office, giving a note to one of the staff, or in the back of the, of the pew in front of you, there's a card that says um, prayer request. Fill that out, and you can drop it off in one of these baskets, or give it to one of the staff, or bring it by the church office. We want to be in prayer for your concerns together and as individuals. And this lets us know who it is among us that needs prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Thank you, God, for the warm weather, the rain and the wind that we've experienced this week. They remind us of how you provide for us and our evidence of your presence with us. Lord, we pray for all those on the prayer list. Be with them all and provide as only you can. We say a special prayer this morning for our pastor, Abril, and for her husband and his health. Move in his body and restore him to wholeness. We also remember mothers this morning. We give you thanks for them and ask a special blessing over them. And for anyone for whom this is a difficult day, we ask you to comfort them. Oh God, bring your peace to this world. Make us whole and help us to be your hands and feet always. We pray all this in the strong name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, it is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. 
I want to be a United Methodist pastor. When you make that decision and you begin the process, you're supposed to make some kind of a public declaration. I never got a chance to make one. Everybody made it for me. Oh, Daniel's going to preach next week. He wants to be a pastor. Or we're going to have him teach. He wants to be a pastor. So I never really said it quite that way. Thanks to all those people who did it for me. But I thought it would be a good way for me this morning to let you know, for those of you who don't know, how I came to be here in Duncanville. I started in seminary in 2018 at Perkins at SMU. And one of the last things that you have to do is do an internship. And they send you to a church so that you can learn. I was blessed to be sent to this great church. I can't tell you how thankful I am for the opportunity I had to meet all of you. If I go on to have my own church, get to pastor somewhere, and I have any success at all, and by success I mean those things that God would count good, if I have any success at all, then it's in large part because of your love, your patience, your guidance, your dedication. I carry the imprint of all of you with me. and For that, I am truly grateful. Thank you very much. There's some people that I want to recognize really quickly. Well, not really quickly. I mean, Abril's not here, so I can do whatever. <laughs> Bob, will you stand up? Where's Bob? Oh, there you go. Okay. I, I didn't just come and just do whatever I wanted to, although sometimes it looked like that. Um, there was a committee of lay people who said yes to supervising my work. When they said yes, that means the chances were less that you would be asked. Okay? Uh, I'm going to tell them not to do it next time so that you can be asked next time. Okay? It's a good experience, or at least I hope it was for you. Bob was the chair of the committee. Uh, Carrie, Carrie's back here in the choir. Don, Master Carpenter back there. Elaine is on vacation. She told me several weeks ago she was not going to be here. Sandy is back here. Beverly, who I knew before I came to Duncanville, and she and I had a very good bond grilling other people who were going through the process of becoming a United Methodist pastor. Thankfully, she wasn't as hard on me as she was on them. And Carol. Let's go, right over here. Thank you. These people um, gave up their time and energy and read and read and read all this stuff that I had to write, and they didn't complain. And I'm so thankful for y'all. Y'all did a great job. And you too, um, an imprint on me. Thank you very much. I, I wish Abra was here, but I totally understand why she's not. I wouldn't be here either. Okay. She um, was someone that I was glad to work with. She taught me quite a bit, and uh, I'm glad that she was my mentor. You are very privileged to have her as your pastor, and so um, I hope you'll remember that. She's tremendous, and I hope she gets another intern too, because we need people like her bringing up the next generation of pastors. Right? All right. Um, to all the staff, thank you very much. It was great working with y'all. Um, well, a good friend of mine always told me, hey, if you ever become a pastor, remember one thing. He said, preach Jesus. Okay? Now, the only reason I'm spending all this time talking about me is because I wanted to make sure to thank everybody. But I think I'm done with that. Let's get to preaching Jesus. Okay? Come on. Let's go. The scripture lesson for this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. And it reads like this. At the time the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? 
If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, in regard to what he has given me, is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All of the Gospels are important, but many church leaders over the centuries, such as Clement of Alexandria, Origen, St. Augustine, John Calvin, and Martin Luther, really elevated the Gospel of John above the other three. John's Gospel isn't just a chronology of events, but an appeal to the heart and head of an individual, and is considered very deep. It's ironic then that John's Gospel is usually one of the first books that in the, of the Bible that a new convert gets when they accept Jesus and are encouraged to read. One caution that I would raise about the Gospel of John is that the writer is highly critical of the Jews. So much so that some have said it has an anti-Semitic tone. Most of John's references to the Jews are really focused on the Jewish leaders. But unfortunately, because he uses such a broad brush, he seems to be slurring all of the people of Israel. I think that any preacher would want to explain this about John's gospel because it could be easy to take on John's tone without even realizing it and sounding anti-Semitic. I think some of you know that I did time <clears throat> in law school. What? What did you think? I was working full-time and attending classes in the evening, and after a few years, I felt that I wasn't making much progress and decided I probably wasn't cut out for law school. Turns out the school thought the same thing. <laughs> However, I was in law school long enough to learn that in the law, every word is important. Every word means something in the law. And the same is true in the Gospels. When what may sound like a throwaway detail is meant to provide context and clarity, as is the case in verse 23. John tells us in this verse that Jesus is walking in the temple, in the portico of Solomon on the east side of the temple. Sounds like no big deal, but it is. The portico of Solomon was the site from where the king would make his judgments and exercise judgment. Here, Jesus is walking in the portico, and by doing so, he is embodying and standing for justice, God's justice, which is what his life and teachings were all about. And to me, my brothers and sisters, justice isn't just about fairness, but rather it is about the redemption of all creation. I would even say salvation. The group confronting Jesus are Jewish leaders, but were never supporters of Jesus and his ministry. They considered themselves leaders of the people of Israel, and Jesus was infringing on their territory. These particular leaders came to Jesus to continue to play their games. If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. 
I can just imagine Jesus rolling his eyes and thinking, not again. They knew. They had seen the miracles Jesus had performed and heard his message. You know how it is. Some people will deny the truth, no matter how obvious it is, in order to safeguard their own self-interest. There is no justice in that. If anything, it puts you at odds with God. The opponents of Jesus were not one monolithic group, but rather they were a few different factions. The competition that's taking place in this text includes multiple sides who are jockeying for position because they feel threatened by Jesus and by the fact that people are responding to his message and his miracles of healing and restoration. There are two sides that consider themselves the obvious leaders, the shepherds of the people of Israel. But Jesus is getting in their way, and they're not having it. The Sadducees, they controlled the temple cult, which were the sacrifices made to God for forgiveness and favor, and was based in Jerusalem. They had good relations with Roman governors and the military police, and they negotiated terms under which the holy place, the temple, would be preserved. They knew what the Romans would tolerate, and they felt they were protectors of, Israel, of the Israelites and their traditional beliefs. The Pharisees were in control of the synagogues, which were scattered throughout all the towns and villages. Their base of support was much broader than that of the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed that strict adherence to the law would be what would win God's favor. It's possible that there could have been another group involved in this competition, the Zealots. They were in favor of direct confrontation with the Romans and were not looking to wait around for a Messiah. These groups were always at odds with each other to gain leadership over Israel. But they were able to bridge their differences because they each opposed Jesus. For them, the best thing for Israel's well-being was the death of Jesus. Many of the leaders in each of these groups believed Jesus was leading the people astray with his preaching and the work he was doing, especially his miracles. The Sadducees offered the people strict adherence to the status quo. The Pharisees told the people they sh that they should just stick with obeying all 613 commandments, and that would eventually bring about the Messiah. And the Zealots, well, they were just hotheads, and they didn't want to hear anything about turning the other cheek. But Jesus was doing something new. He was offering the people something deeper. He was offering to shepherd them in a new way. You would think that after Jesus' death and resurrection, the question of Jesus' identity as God's son and the true shepherd would have been settled. But that isn't the case. Even today, we see a competition among self-proclaimed leaders who have married themselves more to political issues than to Jesus' teachings. In the process, people have been left to wonder how they can distinguish between what is God's truth and what is just empty rhetoric. I think that one of the most damaging things done by some modern-day Christian leaders with self-serving intentions is that they have got, gotten many to believe all that is required to be a Christian is to simply say, I believe, or I accept. Listen, I don't believe Christianity is meant to be complicated, but there is also a danger in oversimplifying it. When we define Christianity according to our own personal standards, we cheapen it. We bring God down to our desired size. 
and we remake God in our own image, which means we refashion God, God's teachings, and demand our needs be met without considering the rest of the world. If you remember last Sunday's sermon, and I'm sure you do, the book of Genesis says we're made in the image of God, not the other way around. At a time when there is so much competition among those who claim to speak for God, my question for you this morning is, whose voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the voices of those who most suit your own political, social, and religious beliefs? You know, people who characterize their opponents as demon-possessed. Or are you listening for the voices of the one who in the Gospel of John says that he is the bread of life, light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the true vine and one with the Father? One would think that Jesus' death and resurrection would have ended the controversies and competition with and among those who thought they could lead the people better than Jesus. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Nevertheless, what was resolved, at least for those that choose to trust and believe, was the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, the true shepherd, the one who would lead us all beside still waters and will go looking for that one sheep that has strayed from the fold in order that they may not be lost forever. Jesus' message wasn't about tradition or maintaining the laws, which were quite burdensome and often unjust, particularly against women. Rather, Jesus preached a message that sought to bring everyone to God's love. There was no hierarchy no VIPs. There were just people who trusted and believed, and they came from different races, classes, cultures, and genders. I know that today some folks are thinking about or have already given up on their faith in God for various reasons, not the least of which are doubts. For too long, people with doubts are considered under attack from the devil. Doubts do not separate you and me from God. You can have doubts and still hear the Good Shepherd's voice, still follow him and know him. Also, I do understand that the competing interests can be too much to deal with especially in these crazy times that we live in. The way some have presented the Christian faith it requires too much or not enough. But I feel certain that you have experienced Jesus' message and work in your lives at those times when Jesus came to you when you were or someone you love sick lonely, anxious, scared, or laying in a hospital bed as good as dead. And then circumstances miraculously changed. That was the true shepherd, the one that has always put you first and safeguarded you so that nothing and no one could snatch you from his hand. My brothers and sisters, whether you know it or not, if you live you, or if you die, we belong to God. Don't be distracted by voices that only have their own best self-interest at heart. Listen for Jesus. Do the work Jesus did. Love the way Jesus loved. And if you do, you will be like Jesus. You will be one with the Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I want to invite Bob Nocturne to come.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Well, like Danny said, um, back in September, uh, the church put together a, a lay teaching committee uh, to help Danny with his internship here at, at the church. And uh, once a month, we would all meet, and Danny would, would meet with us, and we'd just kind of talk about um, his, his, his walk with God here at the church and um, just give comments and, and help him along the way. And uh, it's been, it's been a, a great uh, privilege to be a part of that. And um, even with all the obstacles that, that Danny has faced over the nine months, um, well, Danny, you're, it, it, you finished, you're, you're there. You did a great job. Well, the, the committee wanted to present Danny with something to remember the church by. So we had uh, Dean Singleton took a picture of the sanctuary, and then we had uh, members of the church sign uh, the, um, the picture and put um, the, just messages on there. And Danny, if you could come over here for just a second. Um, We have that picture. I'd like to present it to you today and congratulate you on your journey. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Bless you. Well, this is the fun part. We're going to have cookies and punch out front after, after the service. <laughs> So I'd like to invite anyone who would like to stop by and wish Danny good luck in the future and um, munch on some cookies. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Danny. Either dying or living, either eating or drinking, we are doing for God's glory and his kingdom in Jesus Christ through Holy Spirit. We belong to God, as Danny said. So please stand as you're able and let us sing the closing hymn, hymn number 356, When We Are Living. was saying that the lay teacher committee and I meet every month. We met last uh, Monday night, and um, after the meeting was over, we were just kind of reminiscing about our own experiences, and we started talking about who had been involved in MYF or UMYF, depending on how old you are. And since then, I've been thinking about 
an old benediction or benediction that we used to say, still say, that they still use in MYF or whatever it's called now, youth, United Methodist Youth. And um, I wanted to use that this morning, but I didn't want to trust my memory. So I went and looked it up in the new book of worship that the lay teaching committee gave me Monday night with my name on it. So thank you all very much for that gift. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.